Hello, I'm here and uh, welcome to the Scrum. I'm here with Colonel Douglas McGregor. Uh, he is a decorated combat veteran. He's the author of several books, um, the most recent of which was Margin of Victory, Five Battles That Changed the Face of Modern Warfare. Um, and uh, he most recently was a, an advisor at the Pentagon to President Trump, um, the Trump administration. So he has a, some very, very uh, unconventional and interesting views on US uh, defense policy, which I thought I would uh, share with you today. So uh, first of all, Doug, thanks for joining me. And um, I guess you're free to talk a little bit more uh, openly now that um, you're, you're outside the tent uh, pissing in, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, Happy to be here. Thanks. Um, Let's start, first of all, um, with uh, the new administration. I mean, I realize it's early days, but I've been struck by the fact that we're literally within weeks of coming into power. Um, you know, we've already started a bombing campaign against Syria, which is uh, in some ways surprising to me. In other ways, it's not, because uh, uh, if you look at the people who are in his administration, but it doesn't look that different uh, so far from uh, the, the Trump administration. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on in terms of... Um, the actions taken so far by the Biden administration? Well, one of the things that was difficult for the last president to understand is the extent to which the types and, and kinds of people at the top of the military simply did not change very much from the time when uh, President Bush was in office. And I'm talking about uh, George W. Bush uh, starting in 2001 and when he took over that you had largely the same kinds of people with the same views and attitudes. Uh, there isn't much diversity of thinking in the senior ranks. The senior ranks are, are politicized insofar as they are committed to this sort of perpetual imperialist venture uh, around the world, the, the notion of global presence and global interventionism. There is no updating in their thinking on the basis of a new international system or new technologies. It's simply, we have to stay everywhere that we are. We can certainly add a few new places if necessary, but we don't give an inch. We don't go anywhere. We don't withdraw. And so President Trump discovered in his four years, every time he tried to withdraw us from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Iraq, subsequently Germany, and also when he discussed removing forces from Korea, he met enormous resistance, not just on the Hill, but from the senior officers in the armed forces in the Pentagon, in the and joint indeed, staff, indeed, indeed his own service. his own staff as well, as you pointed out, because I, I one got the sense that um, both uh, Mike Pompeo and certainly John Bolton, when they were in power, um, were, were doing all they could to undermine uh, Trump's initiatives on on North Korea, for example. Well, all three of his national security advisors, McMaster, Bolton, and subsequently O'Brien, were all status quo. Uh, in their orientation. They, they saw no reason to change much of anything, keep everything as it is. And of course, the, the sad truth is that you have to look at two things. First of all, you have to understand that much of what we do is probably mortgaged to vanity. There's an unwillingness to admit that we've destroyed all of the existing security arrangements and stability that existed in the Middle East between Beirut and Basra over many years. There's just nothing left. We created uh, most of the vacuum that exists today, and we created most of the opponents that we've uh, discovered along the way. They were creatures of our invention, if you will, like ISIS and Al Qaeda and so forth. So you put all of that together and you, you have a large number of people at the top today who are very much part of those uh, operations and cultivated uh, people for promotion and advancement by showing their allegiance to these things. It's what I call unconditional obedience to dumb ideas and bad policies gets you promoted. And that's the lesson of the last 20, 25, maybe even 30 years. Go along, regardless of how stupid or bad it may be, try to double down and do what you're told, and try to create narratives that fit the outcome and disguise uh, or conceal the, the level of disaster and you too can be a four star. And then, and then it also becomes a, 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 a almost like a military version of, a, of the sunk cost fallacy that you know that we we've already Absolutely. gone so far um, that to, to turn back now amidst uh, you know we haven't finished the job that seems to be the perpetual rationale for example in Afghanistan. Oh, absolutely. And of course, there's no no danger of the jobs in any of these places ever being finished, and everybody knows it. And that seems to suit people on the hill, in industry, and elsewhere. 
What about, uh, so to just to go back to Syria for a moment, um, let's look at an alternative universe where you're, say, the national security advisor, indulge me a bit, um, and, and uh, the decision is being contemplated, we ought to bomb Syria. Um, what would be your approach? Uh, how, how would it differ from what the, the current administration is doing, for example? Well, President Trump agreed uh, to go after ISIS. Now, that's, that was a decision he made on the basis, I think, of his feelings, those of his advisors, and attitudes in the international system, particularly in Europe and the United States. That may or may not have been the right decision because ISIS really sprang up from former Iraqi army officers, uh, well-funded and supported by Qatar and Turkey, Turkish military intelligence, uh, Turkish assistance in terms of selling oil illegally to fund their operations was a big part of ISIS. And the Turks only became unenthusiastic when ISIS turned periodically on them and others. ISIS was a tiger that bit everyone within its uh, perimeter or within its reach. That tended to change some people's attitudes, but even now ISIS and its remnants and Al-Qaeda and its remnants continue to be supported by people in the region, including Mr. Erdogan in Northern Syria. So I, I'm not sure that it made a lot of sense for us to intervene to try to destroy it because ISIS's principal focus was to destroy the Shiite government and society in Iraq. And this, this leads us to an understanding of what's happening in the region. All of the states that emerged in the aftermath of World War I in the region were former Ottoman territories. In other words, provinces of the greater Ottoman Turkish Empire. And prior to the Ottomans' conquest of the entire Middle East, large parts of it had been governed for hundreds, almost a thousand years by Persians. So the two major powers in the region are really Turkey and Persia. Then you have a set of smaller countries that are casting about for support and allies. This has been true of the Emirates and Saudi Arabia, of course, who, who looked to the British. Once the British withdrew, we filled that vacuum and they've been looking to us ever since. And now in desperation, they're turning miraculously enough to the Israelis because the Israelis and the Peninsular Arabs have discovered that they share the same potential adversary, certainly Iran, but increasingly and, and not spoken of publicly, also Turkey. So if we were to leave, what we would see is a scramble inside that region from Beirut to Basra for control of the oil fields and the territories by Turks and Iranians. The real question is, why should we be involved in that process? It seems that it seems to involve that's ourselves, a, where do we involve ourselves intelligently? Yeah, because it seems to me that this has all been predicated on, uh, you might, you can go all the way back to the Carter Doctrine in 1979 when he declared the Middle East a, an area of vital interests. Of course, you could argue that um, the changing dynamics of the oil market, particularly in the United States, the, the hydraulic fracturing revolution and other aspects of it have, have placed uh, the US in a, in a position where they are ironically one of the swing producers. So there isn't the same kind of um, uh, natural interest, say, between them and, and an oil, a major oil producer like Saudi Arabia. Um, and um, the, arguably, uh, there is more of an interest in accommodating themselves with the Iranians. I'm wondering what, what, what you think of that or, or whether we should take a, a view at all on that. You know, we seem to be taking this view. It's, is it Saudi or is it Iran? Uh, or may, maybe it's neither. Yeah, I, I'm one of these people that thinks that uh, the time is long overdue for us to sit down and talk reasonably with the Iranians. Uh, that, that means the Iranian government, obviously, but we need to understand the dynamics in, in Iran. The majority of the population is not at all happy with their lot in life. They're miserable. Their economy is in ruins. The government has failed them in terms of providing for them or even to protect them, frankly. So the Iranian population has no appetite for war. The people that are interested in conflict at all are small numbers employed by the Iraqi government. We normally refer to them, or excuse me, Iranian government, we normally refer to them as the post Iran. That's about it. And about the only thing they can do is subvert. And they will subvert any government they think is opposed to them. I think we could approach them and we can talk to them about, about their needs, but we've got a problem. We're very close to Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and ultimately Israel. Right now, our strategic partners are utterly opposed to any real dialogue that would result 
in a cessation of hostilities. Now, if we were to pull out and simply say, we've had enough, we're not interested in this permanent condition of hostility with Iran, that might change. Because let's be frank, especially Israel has done business with the Iranians before. There is no reason why they can't do business with them in the future. And the Israelis now have a, a far different and more serious adversary in my estimation on the horizon, and that is Mr. Erdogan's Turkey. And Mr. Erdogan is no fool. He's proven to be a very adroit uh, politician who's maneuvered through very difficult terrain with great success. He's challenged and then withdrawn his challenge with Russia. He's reconciled with Russia, then confronted Russia, and the Russians have seen fit to back away and, and frequently accommodate him because the Russians are not interested in a war with the Turks under any circumstance. That would destroy their economy. So the Israelis are now sitting there with the Russians nearby who have a toehold in Syria. They get along with the Russians. The Russians cooperate with them. And, and in that sense, the Israelis and the Russians have, share an interest. And that is, first of all, keep the Turks as much as possible out of Syria and away from Israel's borders. And secondly, minimize Iranian penetration into Syria because the Iranians may use it as a platform for attack against Israel. Again, these are, these are all the issues that have to be addressed. And then the Emirates, they're simply interested in continuing to do business. And in our absence, they would feel naked in the face of Iranian military power, even though Iranian military power doesn't amount to very much. What about uh, um, the, the US and, 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 and Russia? Um, it, it seems to me that uh, in, in the Middle East, there, there does seem to be a, a multiplicity of areas, as you pointed out, where the, the, it would be it would behoove uh, Washington to work more closely with uh, Moscow. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the, the, the current uh, uh, stance right now. It, it seems that um, the recalibration or the so-called reset is more like recalibrated back to a, a Cold War stance that we had uh, in during the time when the USSR existed. Well, the left seems to have liked the Soviet Union, and it seems not to like the post-Soviet Russia, uh, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. But from our standpoint as Americans, there's no particular reason why there should be any friction or hostility with Russia. Absolutely none. This was President Trump's argument. But President Trump, again, was surrounded by people that kept obstructing any rapprochement with Russia. And he was immediately under attack by the media and the left inside the Beltway for even suggesting it. But the truth is, there is no reason why in these areas we cannot cooperate with the Russians. The Russians have actually played, in my judgment, a positive role in Syria. Uh, they I protected agree. many of the minorities, not just Christians, but anyone who was not uh, a Sunni Muslim. Uh, they have refrained from taking much more violent action than they could have, in my judgment, against many of the Sunni Muslim communities. They haven't been perfect. Uh, neither are we. We've made mistakes. We've had collateral damage. But on the whole, I think the Russians have handled things well. It would be better if we cooperated. But we seem to be determined to keep them out, as though and, their very presence is mendacious and pernicious. And, and it, 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 it's, it's also a product of a, of a collective memory loss, because as, as you have pointed out, um, when uh, the USSR fell, um, we had a chance to reset the relationship with Russia, and we instead moved NATO up to uh, um, Russia's borders. Um, then we went ahead in, in the Yugoslavian civil war and um, bombed uh, Serbia against uh, rabid opposition from from uh, the Russians. So it seems that you know when when people talk about Putin as being this evil mastermind, uh, these uh, factors. Are not really uh, addressed or, or, or you know, the, the, or placed in the in, in the context of his current actions. Well, this this government, more than his predecessor, takes the position that if they're going to work with anyone, they must first convert to this religion of liberal democracy that measures up to the standard that Washington sets for it, which is often ridiculous and unrealistic. But it doesn't matter. In other words, if you don't profess to be a liberal and a democrat well, then we can't work with you and we don't accept you. Quite frankly, that's not our top priority in, in American uh, foreign policy. Our top priority is our own national security and our economic well-being. We should be prepared to work with those who are willing to work with us. I think the Russians would willingly do so under the right circumstances. But of course, if you're gonna run exercises as we're preparing to right now in the Baltic involving cruise missiles and high-speed aircraft and modern technology and allied forces only 50 nautical miles from St. Petersburg, 
you're not likely to get a very positive response from the Russians. I, I, mean, I and, and in the same would respond. in the same context, I, I mean, I I think that applies to Ukraine, uh, and uh, you know, when, when we go back to the uh, um, uh, annexation of uh, Crimea, I, I think many people forget that the Americans played a, a, a role there as well, uh, you know, with the, the fomenting of the Maidan attempted coup and, 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 and making these stupid uh, um, uh, decisions to uh, talk about the Ukraine coming into NATO as if that would have been acceptable to, to Russia. I mean, it, I always say that it's, it's um, you know, we seem to forget that there was this little thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I don't think we reacted very, very particularly well when the, the, uh, the Soviets tried to put missiles in Cuba. And I, I, but this is, it's a, it's a comparable situation in my opinion in, in that part of the world. No, I, I think that's valid. It's probably of far greater importance to the Russians than say Cuba was to us. Cuba is still hostile. Its intelligence agencies work against us with the drug cartels in Venezuela and elsewhere. They're still hostile to us. But in the case of Ukraine, uh, these are brother Slavs that have been a part, of, certainly, of the Tsarist Empire for a long time. Prior to that, they've been independent. Prior to that, they were also under Polish rule, Lithuanian rule. So these borders have changed many, many times. And the people that live in the region have also accommodated new regimes, new governments. Here we sit in the 21st century and we're dictating to people in the region what is or is not correct. Uh, that just is not that simplistic. And there's an unwillingness to let the people that are there find a way forward. I think uh, the president of Ukraine right now, if he was given freedom of action, would probably be willing to sit down and talk with Putin very seriously about how to ultimately reach some sort of conclusion to the crisis. Everybody wants an end to the killing, to this, this economically damaging crisis. Uh, that, that can involve admitting that there are vast areas in current Ukraine that are actually Russified, where the population would be happier under Russian rule, in which case I think Zelensky would listen to that. At the same time, I think he'd be happy to opt for something like Austrian neutrality. But the problem is that neither we nor the Germans or the French or others in Europe are even willing to concede these things. You, you mentioned you mentioned the French and the Germans. It does seem to me that um, the uh, perspectives, or at least the interests, are beginning to diverge somewhat, at least in regard to Russia. I mean, Nord Stream 2 being a perfect example of that. Now, granted, there's uh, divided views in Europe. The Poles are against it, understandably. The Germans uh, seem to be very much uh, in favor of, of continuing this, this, this project. Um, but it seems to me that um, that's an inevitable ability that you're going to see the, the Europeans drawn more back into the Russian orbit again, or, and, and vice versa. Well, I don't know if I would call it Russian orbit, because if you're a German right now, <clears throat> the truth is that the Russian state badly needs German capital, mm -hmm. badly needs German assistance and technology to boost its economy. <clears throat> and both the Germans and the Russians see no evidence that either party wants to go to war with the other. And, I mean, frankly, that's, that's the truth. And the German polling data suggests that the, the German view of people in Eastern Europe is if the Poles want to fight with the Russians, they can do it on their own without us. We're not interested in that. And it's, it's think, and also in regard to that, the the, yeah. uh, the Germans, um, it's uh, of course uh, things are like may change even more in that direction going forward because you know Angela Merkel is on her you know she's on her yeah. last legs as, as as chancellor. She's stepping down soon. The new leader of the <clears throat> CDU, Armin Laschet, seems to have a very very different view of uh, Russian-German relations. Uh, he's made some quite striking comments, I think, uh, which have been uh, questioning the utility of sanctions against them and also um, the approach that we've adopted, uh, you know, this, this Neo-McCarthy approach we've adopted vis-a-vis -vis Putin. So the change might become even more dramatic if he becomes the next leader of the, of the German Republic. Yeah, I think that's a possibility. The other thing is, on the one hand, you've got the Russians who have a bad habit <clears throat> periodically assassinating their opponents on public streets in Berlin. And uh, this is where Germans become frustrated. It's not that they're surprised. The Russians are not Germans. Mm -hmm. And the Russians, quite frankly, and they will tell you this themselves, strictly speaking, are certainly not Europeans in the Western sense. They do business differently. Most Germans, I think, can accept that reality that Russia is ultimately Russia. It will be governed in a certain way, behave in a certain way, and that is ultimately not our affair. 
our real interest in Russia, just as Russia's real interest in us, is to do business that is mutually profitable. I think it's a huge mistake on our part to beat the Germans over the head about Nord Stream 2. Uh, we can't provide the liquefied natural gas in the volume as quickly and as cheaply to Germany and the rest of the people in Central Europe as the Russians can. That's a simple fact. Russia's economy continues to deteriorate. They need to sell this. And the Russians are not stupid. They know that if they fail to sell it to the Germans, the Austrians, the Dutch, and others, Danes who are also buying this, it's not just the Germans, that they'll go elsewhere hmm. and we can sell it to them. I mean, this is a global market now. It's not as though this is the lifeline that if it is suddenly withdrawn or cut off, that it will cause pandemonium and everyone in Western Europe will put their hands up and beg to surrender to the Soviets or the Russians uh, if they can have their gas. I mean, it's just sort of infantile nonsense. At the same time, I think also in Poland, there is a growing awareness, you know, the Russian tanks aren't coming. They're just not rolling. They're not coming for us. And I, I think the Lithuanians are coming around to that understanding. The Latvians, perhaps, Estonians, a little less so. The other thing is that the Finns have proven absolutely conclusively for all time that if you organize yourself effectively and you're prepared to fight like hell, the Russians aren't coming. No, They're not going to the, bother you. They learned that in the 1930s. Well, with that in mind, um, you've, uh, you've been out in print uh, uh, very publicly suggesting that NATO is a zombie organization, that it should be put out of its misery. Um, <laughs> I, I, I presume that uh, you haven't changed your views on that uh, since you wrote that article. No, in fact, <clears throat> I think uh, President Macron's recent response to President Biden's statement that we're back and we support NATO and we're coming back in force and we're going to do all of these things is very, very indicative of where things are headed in Europe. Uh, President Macron said, well, thank you very much, Mr. Biden. But frankly, we know that we Europeans must chart our own course into the future. We have much work to do here on our own. I think that Angela Merkel in many ways is probably the, the last ditch effort on the part of the Europeans uh, to mortgage their future against us. In other words, to essentially pin their hopes on the perpetual presence of US military power uh, to absolve them of the responsibility for defending themselves. And this is, a, this is a serious problem internal to Germany. The Germans have been on a 70 year plus uh, apology tour. We understand that everyone knows why, but the point is it's been over 70 years. And today's Germans have very little connection to what existed in the past. Uh, in some ways that's good, in other ways perhaps not, but the bottom line is it's a new country as a new Republic, a very effective Republic, a very thoughtful, well-educated population. They need to govern themselves. They need to determine what they're going to do to protect themselves and to advance their own interests. I think we're going to see that happen. And as you say, so the, their interests are, are, are diverging increasingly uh, the, between the uh, Americans and, and the Europeans on Russia. It also seems to be the case that that's happening in regard to China as well. Uh, uh, that was one thing I, President Trump, for example, tried to isolate China in regard to the uh, Huawei 5G uh, uh, technology. But it, he extended that beyond that. And interestingly enough, uh, it does not appear that uh, Joe Biden is really reversing uh, those views. It seems to me that the, the Americans have increasingly uh, come to the view that China is a, a strategic competitor and must be treated as such. Uh, the, the Europeans, especially the Germans, don't seem to have the same view. No, I think we, we do not have very nuanced views of the world, Marshall. <laughs> we Americans see everything in stark black and white. You're either good or evil. If you agree with us, and you want to do business with us on terms that we find acceptable, then you're great. But if you insist on different terms, if you insist on a different way of governing yourself, if you insist that your interests do not align perfectly with us, well, then we tend to regard you as the redheaded stepchild that should be beaten vigorously over the head. No, no pun intended, since I see some red hair there. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is that uh, this is stupid. It won't work. And I think uh, President Biden and his friends are going to find this out. One thing that President Trump really got right when he came on board was he said, look, this thing called NATO is an anachronism. The world has changed. Uh, by the way, why are we still sitting in Korea 70 years after the Korean War? This doesn't make any sense. And 
by the way, why are we defending Japan? Japan's a very wealthy, powerful state. It can handle this on its own. And why do we have an agreement that says if they go to war, we come to their aid, but if something happens to us, they don't show up. So Trump got these things right. All he recognized was that the world today is radically different from the world everyone in Washington wants to live in. And I think everyone in Washington is desperate to push us back and push the rest of the world back into this box that they enjoyed in the 1990s in the aftermath of the, of the collapse of the Soviet state. It won't work. It's a dead end. What do you think we should be doing with China? Well, first of all, I don't know that we should even think about doing anything with China. China is so damn big. You've got at least 1.2 billion people. There are four or five versions of the United States inside China in terms of population size. Uh, I'm always disturbed by people that, that talk about, well, what do we do about China? I go back to Kissinger who once was said, well, we should do this with the Soviet Union and that with the Soviet Union. And he said, you know, this state is huge. It's more than one sixth of the world's landmass. It encompasses many other nations as well as Russia. And what do you think you're going to influence in that place? You're not being realistic. Well, that's even more the case in my judgment in China. This is perhaps the world's oldest continuously existing civilization. We've had this thing we called Western civilization for a little over 2000 years. That's fairly recent by Chinese standards. The, the Chinese civilization is not amenable to change. Their way of looking at the world is very different from ours. But we have a habit of imputing to them our views and, and mirror imaging. This is the problem with the notion of the Thucydides trap. Uh, as far as I know, there's no one named Thucydides in the history of the Chinese uh, empire. Uh, there are no Chinese who think like Thucydides, Thucydides. China is a very different place. So the notion that we're gonna do anything with them, I think is ridiculous. I think it makes more sense to, first of all, do something we never do. And that is what are China's core national interests? Stop insisting that China wants to conquer the world. I certainly see no evidence for that. I don't see any evidence that Chinese want to do that. They have trouble governing themselves. They've already got 1.2 billion people. They can't handle much more. But we've taken on this nonsensical view that China is the new version of the Soviet Union that it must be contained, it must be halted, it must be stopped. But when you begin to peck away at the information, the first question you ask is, has China ever stopped a commercial vessel carrying commercial goods on the high seas? Answer, no, it's never stopped a commercial vessel. Well, since we are a maritime power primarily and an aerospace power, we're preeminently interested much as the British empire was in commerce flowing freely, as long as they don't interrupt commerce, what differences make what the Chinese do? I mean, quite frankly, we're about business and so are they. They what want about, to do business. What about Taiwan? That seems to be the one area where, you know, you could say, well, they're not really interested in controlling Asia, but they want a one China, they have a one China policy and Taiwan always comes up in that context. Well, I think in theory, uh, they had a one China uh, set up until we started to walk that particular cat backwards. Uh, the people on Taiwan were happy to be viewed as part of the China Chinese nation, uh, as opposed to something separate and certainly not as something threatening. Again, we pay no attention to historical fact. Taiwan is a sensitive issue. It's been a sensitive issue through the centuries. I won't go back all the incidents reaching back over the last 2000 years in which various disgruntled people have set themselves up on Taiwan and then attempted to subvert or attack China. More recently, and perhaps more importantly than anything else, when the Japanese got control of Formosa, Formosa became Japan's unsinkable aircraft carrier and the base from which it launched all of its major military operations against China, and for that matter, against the Philippines, Malaysia, and, and other countries during the Second World War. The Chinese haven't forgotten that. They have not forgotten that the Royal Navy essentially controlled the Western Pacific and could bottle up China at will and did so on several occasions and fought the opium wars, which worked out to China's disadvantage as we all know. They, represent, they remember these events. And so they see us in many ways behaving today much like the Royal Navy did in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries in the Western Pacific, which is unfortunate. 
because we have no interest in doing any of those things. The second part of it is that Formosa is, is a place that frankly doesn't need to be invaded. Uh, the Republic of China has two major parties. One, and we'll keep it very simple, one is pro-Beijing, pro-Chinese, that's the KMT. They actually have talked openly about reunifying with the mainland under terms that allow them to continue to do business as they do today. In other words, Hong Kong-like. The KMT lost the last bid for election to the presidency by a very slim margin. The party that won is the pro-Japanese party. And people don't understand that Japan's impact on Formosa or Taiwan was enormous. And the Japanese are not hated on Formosa or Taiwan the way they are in other parts of Asia, quite the contrary. And even today, business looks to Japan, looks to cooperation with Japan, integration with Japan as a way to build itself up, prosper and advance into the future. So I think you've got these two parties and then we come along and we decide that this dangerous belligerent power, China, is interested in attacking Taiwan. I don't see it. I think the Chinese know that it would be very stupid to do so. First of all, it would damage their economy. It would be an enormously problematic exercise. There are hundreds of miles of water there. This is not an easy military task. But the second part is, if they were to do this, they would have more enemies overnight on this planet than they've ever had in their entire history. Everyone would turn against China. Chinese are not interested in that. So the question is, under what circumstances would the Chinese take action against Taiwan? Well, if US forces showed up on that island again, if we put aircraft there, if we put any military installation on an island, then suddenly the Chinese would see that as a direct and unambiguous threat and probably feel compelled to take action against Taiwan. Much like the, second, the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. Yes. The yeah. second is, of course, if the Japanese were to go back to Taiwan. And that's not going to happen because the Japanese don't want another war with China. Going into China was the biggest strategic mistake made by the Japanese during World War II. And they want good relations right now with the Chinese, who've opened their markets up to the Japanese for the first time in history. So the bottom line is no one, no one in Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, no one is interested in going to war. Then who is talking about war? We are, the United States. The question is why? Why are we so anxious to uh, essentially create conditions of confrontation with Beijing? In fact, uh, we seem to be interested in uh, creating conditions of conflict around the world still. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Afghanistan, we don't want to take the troops out. Um, Iraq, we still have troops there. Um, we don't want to cooperate with the Russians in Syria. Uh, China, as you say, the, the talk is of a new Cold War. What do you think we should do with the defense budget in the U.S.? Well, remember that we don't have a national military strategy. We have a national spending strategy. To go back to your previous points. If you begin to withdraw these forces from various places, the world will be fine. The world will not end. And our national security will not be hopelessly damaged. Absolutely not. This is the 21st century, not the early 20th. And having forces forward in these areas does two things that are bad. One, tends to absolve the country in question that hosts us of defending itself. Secondly, it very often is a catalyst for conflict because People in those areas may not want us there, even though their government does. So you have a catalyst for conflict and then the problem of absolving the, the local host government of the responsibility to defend itself. The era of forward deployed forces is over. It needs to go away. And the last point, and this is very, very important. The various tools that we had at our disposal just 30 years ago in terms of space-based intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, overhead uh, information, instantaneous communications, precision guided weapon systems, especially missiles, rockets, and other things. That, that's something that the Chinese have, the Japanese have it, the Koreans have it, the Russians have it, even the Iranians have gotten control of much of it. The Turks have got it. In other words, we don't have a monopoly on those things any longer. Anything that's forward and exposed would be destroyed in the opening hours of a conflict. And if you look at Okinawa, the island of Okinawa is smaller than Loudoun County, Virginia, where I live. Much of it is mountainous. And the thousands of Marines that are sitting 
on that island near the airfield, which is used by the Air Force and the Navy, would be targeted and instantly annihilated in the opi opening minutes or hours of any conflict with the Chinese. So the real question is, if you know that, why would you put them there? Well, this is a problem we've got between North Korea, between the border in, in Korea and all the way to Europe. All these forward deployed forces are now very vulnerable and they don't perform the, the mission that they once did, which is to reassure allies of something that we can't provide. We cannot instantly come to anybody's rescue. Let me give you a quick example. This is very important. People need to understand this. <coughs> In 1942, in May, after almost six months, we finally surrendered Corregidor, and 11,000 Americans were marched off into a horrible prison camp on the so-called Bataan Death March. That was May of 1942. When were we able to return? We did not get back to Corregidor in 1942 until the spring of 1945. Now, Japan's economy was 10% the size of the American economy. China's economy is almost the same size as our economy. And China is immediately in the vicinity of the Philippines. And for that matter, all the places that we judge where we should go to quote unquote, stop them. What I'm trying to say is that setting yourself up for a number of corregidors, whether it's in Asia or Eastern Europe is a very dumb idea because we don't live in an era where we are going to be given three years and virtual immunity from attack to build up, go back and recapture everything. So this sort of World War II mentality, this 19th century territorial imperialism that is at the, at the basis of everything we do has got to go away. It makes no sense. So the first thing is you need a national military strategy that recognizes these things, recognizes our limitations our inability to do everything that we did in the past. We simply can't do it. Technology won't allow it. The resources aren't there. So then you have to ask yourself, what if? Well, let's say the Chinese move into the Philippines or move into Vietnam or move somewhere. Perhaps the best thing to do under those circumstances is to let them to continue to move, to overextend themselves. While we decide what it is that we want to do because we know if the Chinese were to do those things, Everyone in the region would be on our doorstep asking us to do something. But then at least we're in a position where we can decide whether or not it's actually in our interest to do very much. There is this assumption that the, the strategy must be extremely active and extremely reactive. In reality, we have the strategic virtue of isolation from much of the world. We don't have to make an immediate decision. We don't have to commit automatically to anything. We have the opportunity to say, look, we want to do business. We want to trade. We wish everyone well. We hope that they will be successful. Our success in business and our success economically can be their success. Or what George Washington and Alexander Hamilton used to say, America's mission in the world is to be its engine of prosperity. If we are, if we are successful, then others will want to emulate us. Well, I think we should go back to that at this point instead of thinking in terms of intervention and forward presence, and instead think in terms of how do we trade and trade effectively on terms that are reasonable. And if we can't do that, we don't need to go to war with anyone. We simply need to back away. And in China's case, in many ways, we will never be able to trade with them on a reasonably level playing field. It's just not in the cards. That doesn't mean there has to be hostility. We can still do business on a, on a limited basis but we have the advantage of this global market. We can trade with everyone everywhere. We're not a landlocked continental power. And on that positive note, I think we'll uh, end the interview here. Um, I, I very much hope that some of your insights are embraced um, by uh, this administration. I fear that they won't be. Um, it may take a bit more time, but uh, uh, I hope you keep uh, speaking out and, uh, and, and speaking sense like this to the American people. Um, Colonel McGregor, uh, Thank you very much for taking the time to, to speak to us. Um, this has been uh, really enlightening. I very much appreciate it.